Well, good morning. Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's so good to see each and every one of you. Before we get started, let me just uh, do a little vision casting. Uh, I like to do that from time to time. Just to remind you, I want to reiterate uh, what Jonathan had said about the Easter weekend. Grab some of these cards, invite somebody, because that is our Super Bowl weekend. We see more people saved on Easter weekend than any other time during the year. So this is very important that you invite. One of our value statements here at Avalon Church is inviting is evangelism. And so we want you to do that. And uh, also pray. Pray that God brings people here. Pray that people have their lives transformed uh, through the gospel. So uh, make sure that you do that. And then don't forget, continue to give. And we have not talked about this as much recently But I just want to remind you, continue to give to the Doing Our Part campaign. Somebody asked me the other day, are we still doing that? Absolutely, we are. And if you've made a commitment to that, that is to help us uh, buy land, build a building, move, et cetera, all that goes in with that. So I hope you'll make sure that you are continuing to do that because, once again, we do that because we want to reach people. That is our purpose We don't do that because we want to build fancy buildings. We don't do that because of any other reason than reaching people with the good news of Jesus Christ. So I hope you'll do that. Well, today we're going to continue in this series called Embrace the Mess, and we've been looking at the teachings of Jesus Christ, and today we're going to continue in that, and I want to talk to you about this thought today, handling hurt. We've all been hurt. We've all had somebody hurt us, and no doubt you've hurt somebody else, whether it was inadvertent or whether it was on purpose, we all know what it's like to be hurt. Sometimes our family hurts us, sometimes our friends hurt us, sometimes the people that are closest to us hurt us, so how do you handle hurts and disappointments and pain when it comes in life? How do you deal with that? Well, Jesus gives us the way. And once again, what he's doing here, you got to see the bigger picture of what he's talking about. He's talking about comparing law and grace, that we're to live by God's grace, not by the law. Now, when I say the law, I'm not talking about the laws of the land. So don't leave here misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting that you don't need to obey the speed limit laws when you leave here, because if you don't obey them, Chances are you're going to get a ticket, all right? So we're not talking about that kind of law. We're not talking about the law of the land. When we talk about the law, we're talking about uh, a works-based approach to being made right with God. In other words, if you think that the way that you go to heaven is by keeping the Ten Commandments or being a good person or being moral, uh, that's just not the way it works. Now, should you follow the Ten Commandments? Yeah. I mean, nobody's suggesting you should say, hey, the pastor said we don't live by the law, so I'm going to go murder somebody today. That's not the way we live. It's not to suggest that you don't need to obey the commandment not to steal. All right. But if you think that doing this is what makes you right with God, that somehow or another, because you're a moral person, that God owes you something, that because you're moral, you're going to go to heaven. Uh, and I've heard so many people that misunderstand what the Bible teaches about the gospel. And they're like, well, you know what? I, I know when I die, God's going to weigh the good against the bad. And the good's going to outweigh the bad. And I'm going to go to heaven. Because I know so-and-so down at that church. And if she's going to go to heaven, I know I'm better than her. And I'm going to go to heaven. Well, you have a misunderstanding of the gospel. So Jesus is showing us a radical new way of living. In Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, it's the greatest sermon that has ever been preached. We call that the Sermon on the Mount. The first part is the Beatitudes. And so Jesus is showing us that he came to the world to show a radical new way of being made right with God. In fact, it's not, it wasn't new. God instituted it with Eve and with Adam and Eve. But he was showing the world that the way to be made right with God is not by being a good moral person. It's not by 
moralistic deism. In other words, that's the idea that, you know, I think God owes me something because I'm a good person. It is that he was showing us there's only one way to salvation. There's only one way to redemption, being made right with God, and that is through the work of Jesus Christ. So in other words, I can't do it, but he can. I can't do it, but therefore I can trust in him by faith that he was the one that kept all the law, never broke it, and he died in my place, and he took on him the sins of my entire life, and he paid the penalty so that I could not experience the wrath of God, but the grace of God. And so that's what Jesus is teaching. Now, he shows us in this particular passage that we're going to read today that even when it comes to hurts in life, there's a new way to do it. What happens to most of us when we deal with hurt, you know what we do? We react, we retaliate, and we want revenge. You ever notice that? We react, we retaliate, and we want revenge. And Jesus is showing a radical new way of dealing with hurt. In fact, the old way doesn't work. You can react, you can retaliate, you can seek revenge, and it never ends. That cycle will never, ever end when you approach it that way. But he shows us a brand new way uh, to act, a brand new way to live. Now, here's what I know about hurts, uh, that if you don't deal with them, they're going to turn into something bigger. Where I grew up, uh, two stories of the illustrate this, and I was a little boy, and I noticed it, and my parents explained to me what happened. There's a family uh, that lived next door to another family, and they were best friends. In fact, they did almost everything together. Their children played together. They did events together. They loved each other. Well, when I was a little boy, there was something strange that I noticed that had happened between these two houses. And I asked my parents, what happened here? Because there was a, there was a fence, and next to the fence, there was a row of shrubs, and on the other side of the fence was a row of trees, and then on the other side of the row of, of, uh, of bushes was another set of trees, and it looked like it turned almost into a forest between these two houses. And I asked my mom and dad, I said, what in the world? That's the strangest looking thing I've ever seen. And they explained to me that this family, these two families that at one time were very close, they, somebody got hurt, somebody got offended, somebody said something that maybe got wrong with them, and so they stopped talking to each other. These were best friends. They stopped talking to each other. They got mad at each other. They kept on getting angrier and angrier until one day the properties that were right next to each other and the kids that could go back and forth, one of them put up a fence. And to show that they were not going to be outdone, the other family said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put up a row of shrubs. And so they put up a row of shrubs. And the other family said, well, we're not going to be outdone by that. And they put up a row of trees. And then the other family said, well, we're not going to be outdone by you. And they put up a row of trees. And it was the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen. And it illustrates that when you react and you retaliate and you seek revenge, it never ends well. There was another family that, uh, it, was, it was kind of a funny thing, actually. Uh, there was this house and uh, right next to it was a trailer. I mean, when I say right next to it, it literally almost touched the house. And everybody in the community knew that what had happened was there was a husband and wife, and they got really mad at each other, and uh, they never got divorced, but they couldn't stand the sight of each other. And uh, so the husband went out, he said, I'll show you, and he bought a trailer and put it right next to their house, and here this family, they would get up every morning, they would eat breakfast together, but they would not speak. Uh, he would go off to work, she would go off and do her thing, and when he came home in the evening, uh, they would have supper together, and they would not speak, but they would live in separate houses on the same property. Now, what is the point? The point is, if you don't learn how to handle hurt, 
you're going to do something dumb. You're going to do something that you're going to end up regretting. And the worst part of it is you're never going to get peace. You're never going to get relief. But Jesus shows us a radical way that works. Now, you may not like what he said. You may think, well, that's, that's too hard. That's too harsh. That's too much. But if you'll do what he said, I promise you, you'll be able to have peace and healing in your heart. Let's read together. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He was quoting from the Old Testament. You heard it said, in the Old Testament it says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, Jesus was also referring to the fact that in the Old Testament, they were not just setting up personal laws, but these were civil laws. They were governmental laws. And so, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is important to have a culture that works by the rule of law. You understand what I'm saying? So in other words, if someone breaks into your house and steals your property, they need to be held accountable. That's what it means, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So it's talking about uh, civil law and governmental law. But when you live by that in your personal life, it gets Gets, it gets to be a problem. He said, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. I don't know about you, but that is impossible nearly for me. Somebody slaps me, and I haven't been slapped in a long time, okay? But when I was a young man, uh, if you slapped me, I was going to slap you back, but I was going to slap twice as hard right? He says, but if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. I'm going to explain what that means in just a minute. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. So not just the outer garment that they would wear, but also your coat, the thing that they would use as a blanket to keep warm. Many people, especially if they were poor, this was the only way they could stay warm at night. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, the key to understanding this is the word force. If anybody forces you, this is not like, you know, hey, would you help me do something? No, this is if somebody does something that is not right. They force you to do something that's not right, and you feel that anger welling up in you, and you feel that revenge welling up in you. He said, don't just walk a mile Walk two. Once again, I'm going to explain what that means in a moment. Give to the one who begs from you. And no, he's not talking about your children. All right, so uh, give to the one who begs from you. Dad, can I have 20 bucks? Dad, can I have this? Dad, can I borrow the car? Thank God all, uh, Kim and I have all grown children and they still cost us money. I don't know how that works, but nevertheless. He says, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, understand the backdrop of what he's doing here. He's wanting to show us the futility of the law and the need for grace. Okay? So get this in your heart. He's talking about the need for grace. We can live eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but it never ends. The revenge will never end. I don't know if you've heard of the Hatfields and the McCoys, that's something that is a true story that has become legend in American folklore, in American culture. And it's two families that were friends and somebody got sideways with somebody and they ended up getting so angry that somebody in one of the families shot another one and for decades and generations, they hated each other. And, and I think the point here is Jesus was saying that if you're going to live that way, you better hold on because you're going to have a whole lot of bitterness and a whole lot of anger and a whole lot of pain, and it's not ever, ever going to end. So I want to show you four things that Jesus was talking about here, four things that you and I deal with in having to handle hurts. So the first one is this, arguments, arguments. 
Uh, he says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, I want you to understand what Jesus was talking about here. The slap on the cheek was not so much as an act of violence as it was an insult. Because what they would do is they would slap with the back of the hand. Um, and, and basically, it was to put another person down. It was to insult them. It was to embarrass them. And, and I think the point here is not to add to the growing insults, to end it with grace, to end it by forgiveness. It's better to suffer unjustly than to add to the spiraling conflict. I think that's what Jesus was teaching here. And so if your goal is to win an argument, what Jesus was showing is that you lose. Now, husbands and wives can really be guilty of this, that your goal is to be right, to get the last word. And you know what? If you live that way, pretty soon you are going to have the very last word that you're ever going to have with each other. And the point is this, if somebody doesn't stop the argument, if somebody does not act with grace, then it always, always spirals out of control. For married couples, it can end in divorce. Uh, for family members, it can end in not seeing each other or refusing to talk to your brother or sister or aunt or uncle or cousin, and you'll never even go to family gatherings again because you've got bitterness and anger in your heart because of an argument. Now, here's the principle, and I want you to get it. The principle about dealing with arguments is don't insult or retaliate. Don't insult. Is it hard for, is it just me, or is it hard for you not to insult somebody that insults you? Is it hard not to speak back and to try to be, to, to ratchet it up even more? Of course it is. But Jesus was giving the principle that with arguments, what we must do is we must act with grace and refuse to insult. You see, Jesus was not talking about self-defense or war here. A lot of people think that what Jesus was saying was to be a pacifist. And I don't believe that's what he was teaching here at all. In fact, in the Old Testament in particular, uh, it talks about your private property. It talks about fighting in wars and self-defense. So is Jesus saying that if somebody breaks into your house, that you should get up out of your bed at nighttime and you should say, hello, friend, uh, let me show you where my valuables are. No, that's not what he's saying. You know that Quakers are known for nonviolence. I heard about one Quaker that uh, someone broke into his house. And he had been known, he was a Quaker pastor, in fact, he had been known to preach nonviolence and to preach that you should never retaliate and to preach living by peaceful principles. But he just happened to have a 12-gauge shotgun. And this guy had broken into his house, and this Quaker preacher comes down the stairs holding his 12-gauge shotgun, and he says to that person that broke into his house, hello, friend, I mean thee no harm, but thou standest where I'm about to shoot. <laughs> All right, so the, the fact is, Jesus is not saying that you shouldn't defend yourself, that you should let people break into your house and steal your stuff, or that if you're in the army, or, or that you should not fight. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying is we've got to learn how to overcome arguments. Let me read to you from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. And, and this is uh, partly what Peter wrote, but also he quotes from the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Listen to what he wrote. He said, don't be hateful and insult people just because they are hateful and insult you. Hello. Not easy, right? He says, instead, treat everyone with kindness. Wouldn't it be amazing how many arguments will be solved if you just decided to be kind? He said, you are God's chosen ones and he will bless you. The scriptures say, and he's quoting from Psalms here, do you really love life? I do. I love living. I love being alive. I love all the blessings God has given me life in life. He says, do you really love that? He says, do you want to be happy? Well, duh. Is there anybody here that says, my goal in life is to be miserable? 
My goal in life is always to be sad. My goal in life is always to be angry. No, we all want to be happy. He says, do you love life? Do you want to be happy? Listen to what he says. This is incredible. He doesn't say, go get a second job and get more money in the bank. He doesn't go say, get another car. He doesn't say, go buy another house. Listen to what he says. It's incredible. He says, then stop saying cruel things. (laughs) You want to be happy? Quit being cruel to people that have been cruel to you. He, He says, stop telling lies. Give up your evil ways and do right as you find and follow the road that leads to peace. The interesting thing is that Jesus said, if you have an argument, if there are arguments in your family or at work or with your neighbor, anybody have, don't raise your hand, anybody have a neighbor that just aggravates you? Anybody have a neighbor? I've lived in places before, not now. I have wonderful neighbors uh, now because I don't know them, and uh, I've I've not met many of them. And so anyway, uh, but I had, where I lived one time, I had a neighbor that would blow his grass clippings onto my driveway after every time he mowed the grass. I asked him to quit, and he kept doing it. Now, I don't know about you. But my old flesh took over in that kind of situation. I wanted to throw everything from my yard into his yard. I mean, I literally was tempted, I didn't do it, to dump my garbage on his front lawn. Now, that would not have been a Christian thing to do, all right? But what I'm saying is this. If you want to find peace and be happy, Jesus said you got to resolve with grace. Don't insult, and you'll win the argument. That's what he's saying. Here's the second thing he says, abuse. Abuse. Now, I'm not just talking about sexual abuse, but verbal abuse. Listen to what he said. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Uh, See, this was an attack on human dignity because nowhere in the text, and this comes from the Old Testament, by the way, nowhere in the text does it suggest that a person did not owe a debt. Okay? So, Uh, This was suing someone that owed them rightfully so. But what they did was they abused this person. Now, and I don't have time to get into all the Old Testament law, but the person that he was talking about here was an unreasonable person. A person that abused the law, abused the situation, and as a result, abused the other person. Okay? Okay. Listen to Exodus 22, 25 to 27, and this will let you know about this principle here. He says, if you lend money to any of my people who are in need, do not charge interest as as a money lender would. And he's talking about other Israelites. It was okay for Israelites to charge interest to people that were not a part of the family, okay? But the Old Testament law said you were not to charge. And by the way, At the end of every seven years, if somebody had borrowed something from you, you know what the Old Testament law was? And this is grace, that the debt was completely forgiven. You no longer owed, that was the law. Listen to what it says. Uh, It says, if you take your neighbor's cloak as security for a loan, you must return it before sunset. This coat may be the only blanket your neighbor has. How can a person sleep without it if you do not return it and your neighbor cries out to me for help? Then I will hear for I am merciful. Aren't you glad God's merciful? Man, I am so glad, so glad that he's merciful. Now, what was he saying? His principle is very simple. Be kind or be a blessing. If you have a situation that you could, by law, abuse a person. He's not suggesting that if somebody owes you money that you don't collect it. Okay, that's not what he's saying. By law, this person did owe. And and, and I realize we don't live by the Old Testament law anymore, but listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7. He said, do for others what you would want them to do for you. This is the teaching of the laws of Moses in a nutshell. So that's the golden rule. So if you want to know how to deal with somebody that is going above and beyond, they are being abusive toward you, not suggesting you don't owe a debt, not suggesting that they don't have, you know, something to stand on, 
but they're going above and beyond. They're abusing you. Jesus said, you need to be kind or be a blessing. Be kind or be a blessing to others. That's the way you deal with abuse. I read a story a number of years ago that illustrated this in ways that I can't even imagine. Uh, this was a story of a, of a husband and wife who had a daughter that was just entering into her adult years. And there was a man that through circumstances, I won't go into all of that, but he ended up murdering their daughter. She was not even 20 years old. Murdering their daughter. This was a Christian couple whose daughter had been murdered. And you can imagine they were out for revenge. They wanted the death penalty for this person, and rightly so. But God began to work in their heart. And this couple who had lost their daughter to the most heinous crime imaginable, they decided that what God wanted them to do was to pray for this man and to forgive him. And the more they prayed for him, the more God impressed on their heart that what their next step was was to go visit him in prison. And they did. I can't even hardly tell this story without getting emotional because this, this couple visited the murderer of their daughter in prison and they said to this man, we forgive you. We forgive you. Now, I gotta tell you, the only the grace of God can do that because I tell you what, if I think about somebody murdering someone in my family, forgiveness is the very last thing that I'm thinking about. In the end, they visited him on multiple occasions. And this man, he didn't know what this murderer, he did not know what they were getting after. But eventually, this Christian couple won this man to Jesus Christ in prison. Now, he didn't get out of prison. He still had to serve time. But you know, this couple, and someone had interviewed them and asked them about that. They said, we had to forgive this man. They said, Why? They said, because it was the only way possible for us to have peace. Now, you think about that. That is exactly what Jesus is teaching, that if you have abuse, and that's a, certainly a, an extreme case, but if someone do, does you wrong, the best way to deal with it is not revenge, it's not reacting, but it's forgiveness. So the principle there is be kind or be a blessing. Here's the third thing Jesus dealt with, animosity. Animosity. Now, we've all faced that. Some people that have animosity toward us or maybe even people that we have animosity towards. And, and once again, the principle I want to explain, he said, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, to explain this so you understand what Jesus was saying, it was customary in law in, in that era, in that time, first century Palestine, it was customary for leaders or soldiers, either one, if they were a political leader or if they were a soldier, then they could compel you on their behalf by law. They could force you to carry their weapons, their cargo, or whatever it is they were trying to move for one mile. That was the law. They could force you against your will to use your animals to carry their stuff or to make you carry their stuff if they were tired for one mile. That was the Roman custom. In fact, this is where the saying, go the extra mile comes from. You ever heard somebody say that? Well, he went the extra mile. In other words, he went above and beyond. Well, that's from the teaching of Jesus. He said, if somebody by law he put that, didn't put that in there, but that's what he was talking about. If somebody by law, by right, compels you to carry their stuff and you just have animosity, can you imagine how enraging that would be? How humiliating that would be? I mean, this person, they're going along minding their own business and suddenly a soldier interrupts their day, interrupts their time, interrupts their schedule and forces this person to carry his gear for a mile, for a mile. Jesus said, if somebody forces you to do that, then go the extra mile. 
Now, the principle here is just that, go the extra mile. When it comes to dealing with animosity, when it comes to dealing with people that have hurt you, Jesus said, go above and beyond. Go the extra mile. They may not be reconciled with you. That's okay. You go the extra mile. You do what is extra, and God will bless you for that. Um, Do you remember the story about Rebecca in the Old Testament? The story is that uh, Abraham's son, Isaac, uh, was in need of a wife. And Abraham, as he was an old man, sent his servant to find a wife for Isaac. And this servant, who was a godly man, prayed, God, when I come to water my camels, and he had 10 camels, by the way, The Bible gives us that story, the number. He had 10 camels. He said, let the person that you want to choose as a wife for Isaac be the one that offers willingly to water my camels. Now we hear that and we're like, okay, she turns on the garden hose, big deal. Well, you need to understand that camels um, were capable, are capable of drinking 50 gallons of water at one time, 50 gallons of water. And especially if they've come across the desert or they've been on a a hike or a caravan or whatever, they're going to drink on average 50 gallons of water. So what happened? Oh, the servant came and sure enough, Rebecca says, would you like some, or he says, would you give me some water? She said, I'll give you water. She said, in fact, I will water your camels for you. Now, understand, she had probably a pitcher that held, what, two gallons, maybe three at the most. And um, she had the audacity to say, you've got 10 camels. Now, I'm sure she wasn't doing the math, but let me do the math for you. 10 camels, 50 gallons each, 500 gallons. And let's just divide that in half. That's one thousand trips to dip water and to water those camels. I would say that she went the extra mile. Now we know the rest of the story, but she did not at the time. The rest of the story was that she got married to a very wealthy man and she became part of the heritage of Jesus Christ. She did not know when she went the extra mile, what the end result was going to be, but she did it anyway. And the principle is this. You want to be blessed by God, go the extra mile. I know sometimes it may seem unfair, but listen to what the apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2, 17. He said, honor everyone. You ought to just commit that to memory. Honor Everyone, even people you disagree with, even people that vote differently than you, even people that believe differently than you, even people that are unkind to you, honor everyone. Then he goes on and says, love the brotherhood. In other words, people in the family of God. So you honor everybody. You love people in the church. Fear God. We're to worship God with all of our heart. And then he tags something at the end that is incredible to me. Honor the emperor. Now we read that and we're like, yeah, okay, we don't really even let it register with us because we don't live in the culture that they lived in. But do you know who the emperor was when Peter penned this? Nero, the very one that would end up martyring Christians. Nero, Peter wrote, honor the emperor. Now, let me ask you a question. This is just something that you need to tuck down in your memory. Um, is it ever dawned on you that not everybody that wins a political office is someone that you voted for? Sometimes there are people that are different than you. They believe differently than you. And I'm not suggesting that their way is right. If you want to know what's right, come to me and I'll tell you. All right? So, I'll tell you what needs to happen in this country, right? But the interesting thing is that God compels us that even when people have the audacity to disagree with us, 
when there's animosity, and I don't know about you, but I cannot watch the news without picking up on animosity. God compels us to pray for our leaders and to honor them. Now, it doesn't matter to me which side of the political aisle you're on, whether you're conservative or not conservative or whatever. God calls all of us as believers to give honor and to pray for it. Doesn't mean you have to vote for them. Doesn't mean you agree with them. I'm sure Peter did not agree with Nero. I'm quite sure of that. But you know what he said? We're to put honor because God is the one that tells us to do it. And so this is the point. If you can learn to honor people even that you disagree with, even that you vehemently disagree with, God says that he will bless you. And here's the last thing, we, we wrap it up. It's the word aggravation. Now, animosity is pretty serious. Abuse is pretty serious. Arguments are serious. Aggravation, not quite so much. There are lots of things that just aggravate you. Uh, sometimes I get aggravated trying to put on my pants. And I'm like, you know, lose my balance or whatever. And I'm, I, I just get angry all of a sudden. I'm aggravated over something that shouldn't bother me at all. But here's what Jesus said. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow. By Mosaic law, the debts that could not be paid back were to be forgiven every seven years. As I told you earlier, Israelites could charge interest to foreigners, but not to their Jewish brothers and sisters. Now, in Proverbs, it tells us not to put up security for debts. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? And anytime you want to understand a biblical principle, you got to look at all of Scripture. So on one hand, God says, don't be foolish with your money. Your cousin that for the fifth time has the greatest money-making idea in the world and every other one has failed, you are not obligated to let him borrow $5,000 or $5 for that matter. So he's not suggesting that. Um, but what he is saying is that we must be generous, especially to people in God's family. There are going to be people that aggravate you, but be generous. There are going to be people that just aggravate you with their personality. You know what you need to learn to do? Be generous toward them. And by that, I don't mean just giving them money. Be generous toward people that tick you off. Be kind. Be generous toward people that you're like, well, I would never hang out with that person. Be generous. You might be surprised. And can I just kind of let you see my heart for a minute? Um, years ago, when we first started small groups here at this church, I was the one that said we needed to do it, but I did not believe in it. And let me tell you why. Because I knew it was going to aggravate me. People coming to my house that I didn't know and bringing food that I didn't like. And, you know, sitting on my couch and getting things messed up because I'm a bit of a neat freak. I'm like, they just brought grass in. And I just knew that I'm not, I'm good at talking to groups of people. But when it, and I'm good at one-on-one. -on -one, but when it talks, you know, a group a little bit bigger or whatever, I don't know what to do. I'm kind of like Ricky Bobby. Don't know what to do with my hands, you know. And it just, it, it can be aggravating to me. And so when we started that, I was like, nope. Not going to do it. Everybody else in the church, you need to go to a small group, but not the pastor, because it aggravates me. And I'm not going to point out the people that are in our small group or have been in our small group in the church, because you might think that I'm talking about them, and I'm not, all right? But you know what began to happen? Those people that I thought were going to aggravate me, I fell in love with. People that probably under normal circumstances, I would not have given the time of day. Oh, as a pastor, yeah, speak to them. You got to love everybody. Yeah, be that guy, right? But I'm talking about somebody that was actually friends, actually loved, not just as a pastor loves the whole church, but love them for who they are, learning about their family, learning about their work, learning about their life, and learning about their problems. And all of a sudden, it began to dawn on me that what I needed to do was be generous. Not just with my time on stage, but be generous and allow people into my life, even as a pastor. 
And I got to tell you, years later, you could not stop me from having a small group. You know why? Because I've developed friends and I've developed people that I love. And I have learned that there's more to church than just showing up on Sunday morning. And when you begin to learn that, then, then you'll learn what it means to be truly happy and truly connected. You want to be connected to a church? You want to feel that love? You want to feel like, man, that you couldn't pry me away from this place? Get involved. Get in a small group. Be generous with people that you might say, ooh, that one's a little bit weird. And by the way, if you do get in a group that you don't connect with anybody and you think they're all weird, I'm pretty sure they think you're weird too. And you don't have to stay in that group. Go, go to another one, okay? There is no law that says once you join a group that uh, the only way you can leave that group is to leave the church. That's not the way it works, okay? But my point is this. You need to learn to be generous. Listen to James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, and I'm done. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. Let it grow. Let, no, no. You, you, maybe that's where that song came from. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect, in other words, mature, and complete, needing nothing, lacking nothing. Does that remind you of another scripture somewhere? Oh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know why? For he leadeth me into green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters and he restores my soul. You want to be restored? You want to have that kind of peace? You want to be able to deal with aggravations in your life? Because let me tell you something. They're going to be aggravations probably every day of your life. God says, let your faith grow. Uh, and when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. So what he's telling me there is this, that, you know, if something's aggravating me, ask God for help. God, I don't know why this person just ticks me off. It just, their face just makes me angry. The, the way that they do their lunch, when it's lunch break, and I watch the way that she unwraps this stuff, and I'm like, you know, would you just open the freaking thing? God says, ask him for wisdom. Amen? So if you want to know how to deal with arguments and abuse and animosity and aggravation, follow what Jesus said and don't insult, be kind, go the extra mile, be generous. And when you do that, you're going to grow, you're going to have joy, and you're going to become mature. But the key, the key to all of this that Jesus was teaching is that we ask for help. You ask God for help, he'll give it to you. You ask God for help with that difficult brother-in-law, he'll give it to you. You ask God for help for that person at work that just aggravates you to no end, he, he will give it to you. You ask God for help with the hurts in life, and he promises, I will give you wisdom if you'll just ask. Heavenly Father, we ask today that you give us wisdom, that you help us Help us know how to live life. Help us know how to handle hurts. Help us know how to handle aggravations and animosity and arguments and abuse. Help us to follow what you say. Before I finish my prayer, and for those of you online as well, if today you would like to receive Jesus as your Savior, I've got good news. Just in the same way that he says to ask for his help in dealing with these difficult things in life, he says, ask me and I will save you. And so today, if you'd like to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, listen closely. It's not your works. It's what Jesus did. And it's really not a magical prayer. It's an act of faith. You just say, God, save me. He says, if you'll ask, he'll do it. And so... 
Maybe you say something like this. Dear Jesus, I'm asking, save me today. I believe you're the son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose from the grave, and I'm simply asking. And so today, if you ask, put the, at the, check the thing at the bottom of your screen that you prayed to receive Christ today. And, um, and, and we'll help you with your next step. If in the room you prayed that prayer today or you want to pray that prayer with no one looking but me, how many would say, Pastor, I need to pray that prayer. I want to pray that prayer right now that I will be saved, that I'm going to ask him right now. Would you just lift your hand? Anybody like that? Lift your hand in the room if today you prayed to receive Christ, okay? Um, Let me encourage you. I want everybody to look around. Look around. Just look around. I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. Look around. If you don't see anybody here that's not saved today, solve that problem. Invite somebody next week. Invite somebody for Easter. You know why? People don't get saved if they're not unsaved people in the room. And the truth is, and man, I love this church, and I love how we really do a good job of inviting people. But you know what? We want to see more people saved. We got to get more visitors here. We got to get more people here. And so I want to encourage you to take that personal challenge that inviting is evangelism. And you invite somebody and they'll come. And I can promise you, I will be faithful to preach God's word to the best of my ability and give them the opportunity to be saved and lead them in that if you will invite them. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the day. Help us now to be that church that cares for people, that handles hurts, and that brings people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.